Um, it's kind of amusing that the uh, legendary wind tunnel of first year lab past um, popped into my head in the middle of that lecture. Um, it was actually pretty cool. It used to run along the ceiling of the first year lab and it had um, a sticker on the side of it. And those of you who've seen Snoopy will know that um, sometimes in some of the Snoopy cartoons, you would have the doghouse and Snoopy sitting on top with, you know, like the leather mask and goggles and scarf of um, World War One pilots. And um, that sticker was on the side of the uh, wind tunnel. It was pretty cool. Um, back in the days where we did things properly at universities, like electrical engineers used to make real circuits with real components rather than just model them in piece by <laughs> and all those sorts of things. Okay, um, so today's background is from um, the Ala Odori Festival, um, which is held in Koenji, a little suburb of Western Tokyo, um, every summer. And I accidentally walked into this thing. I decided, oh, I'm just going to go to Koenji today and got on the train and was wondering why there were so many people on the train, got off the train, all the people got off the train with me and then just suddenly turned up in the middle of this festival. And um, it's hard to describe it in words. So um, here's a few seconds of my favorite bits. <laughs> Um, basically everyone sits around on the streets drinking beer and eating snacks and when the beer runs out they can always walk into the family mart across the road and pick up some more and uh, everyone basically sits down watches the show as they parade around town all night um, has a good rowdy evening plenty of good food and then they all go home um, and there's never any trouble at these things they're always good and entertaining and fun um, it's a pretty stark contrast to places like Sydney which are a bit of a um, cultural vacuum in many ways as soon as the local killjoy politician um, like <laughs> finds out that someone is having fun somewhere the uh, state police Gestapi are sent out to dismantle it or put fences up or start illegal strip searches or whatever it is they want to do to take away people's fun um, it's one of the things I miss about Japan is just how much fun they have in festivals and streets and stuff like that that doesn't happen here Okay, so um, change of topic here to things that spin. Um, and those of you who like rides, um, I love roller coasters and all things that do strange linear motions, even, you know, upside down and high G and stuff like that. But I've never been able to take the really spinny rides. Um, I can't think of anything worse than um, the nice description in here of, uh, where is it? Um, uh, in a layer of soft foamed polyurethane which ensures maximum passenger comfort while they undergo the stresses of this ride which basically result in you getting off and wanting to throw up all over the place um, never found that terribly amusing anyway could rather interesting to realize that there actually is a ride called the vomitron um, out there okay so most of the rest of this of my part of the course anyway is going to be rotational systems okay um, things spinning relative to one another and how to handle those and and some some of the cool effects that pop out of it um, okay so when we're dealing with rotational systems um, in mechanics we pretty much always restrict ourselves to rigid bodies um, if we're not dealing with rigid bodies things get rather difficult you know if you're dealing with fluids and stuff like that it's a whole separate um, line of work rel relating to spinning fluids and stuff like that so we keep it nice and simple we make it rigid bodies so that we're dealing with solids and everything behaves itself well and when we do this we can classify two different situations in here right the first one is that we have a body that's rotating about a point that is fixed in some um, inertial frame. So basically my um, ball can be stationary and spinning about the center of itself or we could even have it in a situation where it's spinning around a point on its surface, right? Like so. Um, and that would be a completely different kind of motion that we can describe with what we're going to set up in the next few lectures. Um, 
The other is that the body has no fixed point in um, our inertial reference frame. So for example, you can imagine that this thing is spinning while it's moving and there's no fixed point, right? At any particular point in time, there's a rotation about some point. It's moving, but that point is moving, okay? And those two situations are different, but what we can do is reduce the second one back to the first one. So what we tend to do in systems where you've got rotational motion about no fixed point is to generate yourself a fixed point. And so what you do is you look at the center of mass, mass motion, so the actual dynamics of this thing, extract that off, and then consider what happens to the rotation about that center of mass. And that would basically bring us back to a stationary object that's rotating about its center of mass, which then becomes the fixed point, okay? So fairly simple, and in all the way through this, we're always going to do this. If we've got um, no fixed point, we're going to arrange a fixed point by basically working out what the center of mass motion is and subtracting that off um, the motion of the object. Okay. Then we get to a thing that we call Euler's theorem, and you're going to hang on, which Euler's theorem? And I always do as well. Whenever I see an Euler's theorem in a book now, it's like, which one are you talking about? Because there's thousands of them. Um, so Euler's theorem in this part of the course is basically that the most general motion of any body relative to a fixed point O is a rotation about some axis um, through O. So basically what we're saying here is that um, if we've got, if, once we've extracted our um, center of mass motion off um, and we've got um, ro uh, motion relative to some fixed point, um, it's just going to be rotation and there will be some axis through that fixed point about which that's, that rotation occurs, okay? Um, you can imagine doing all sorts of funny things by uh, putting accelerations and stuff in, but the most general motion is just going to be a rotation about an axis through there, okay? And what we need to do is define both that rotation in terms of its velocity, but also that rotation in terms of um, its direction as well. And so one thing that comes off the back of this is defining an angular velocity vector. And we define the angular velocity vector as um, the velocity of rotations, the angular um, velocity, and the direction of the axis, right? And so the direction u here is given by the right-hand rule and this is one of two right-hand rules that are going to turn up in this part of rotational motion that we go through, okay? Um, and this one is given by sort of the um, thumbs-up rule that I, I often call it. Um, the thumb points along u and the fingers curl in a direction of rotation. It's actually a really easy one. So if my object is spinning like this, um, my fingers would go round the motion that's rotating and my thumb points the direction of the um, axis, okay? And so if you see a body rotating clockwise, so I actually should turn around here to do this. If you've got the body rotating clockwise like this, then um, you're going to have your fingers going um, for your right hand round that way and so U is going to point away from you round into that direction, okay? Clockwise goes back. Fairly simple, you get used to it. Um, it's one of the easier right hand rules to remember because the um, rotation following your fingers um, is, is, is a quite a natural way to do it. Okay, so that's angular velocity. Then we need to define um, velocity itself in here, okay? And so um, if you imagine a, a body rotating about its center of mass O, um, there, you can have a velocity of a point P on that body and it will have a linear velocity in addition to its angular velocity, okay? So this sort of diagram that we've got here, it's actually useful to spend a few seconds um, to just think about it a little bit. Um, you could imagine this is some point over down here and you've got just a particle that's some point away above it going round in a circle. And, you know, from a first year perspective, that might be the case. But what we're really doing here is imagine you've got a sphere. Um, o would now be the fixed point, which is the center, right? So you can imagine it's rotating about, let's put, put it this way. Um, so the axis is going through this uh, cross point in, in, in my little basketball here. So it's rotating like this. 
And then my point O is going to be right here at the center of, of this object, so it's buried on the inside. And then you can imagine that I might be interested in some little point right on the surface here, okay? Um, and that is now my point P that's just in here. And if this object rotates, you can see that it's basically going to go around a circular motion, okay? Now, there will be... Uh, distance r away from the center of that spherical object, which is this um, r vector here, because we're defining the origin of our coordinate system to be the center. And some of why we're doing that is that later on we're going to attach a reference frame to this rotating object, and that we want that to be our origin. Okay, um, So we're setting ourselves up here. The other thing that's sometimes interesting is to know the distance of this point, not from the center, but from the nearest crossing to the axis of rotation, right? And that would actually go through the side here to intercept that axis. And you can see that is basically this line just here. And in all of the notation I'm going to do, we're going to call that rho, okay? So it's the Greek letter for R. Um, and it's just big R, uh, sorry, R, R sine um, theta, where theta is this angle on the inside. Um, this angle theta on the inside that goes from zero at top to pi at the bottom is a thing that we often call the co-latitude. Um, if you think about sphere being the Earth, the latitude is basically the angle where you come in, uh, the equator is zero degrees, plus 90 degrees is the top, minus 90 degrees is the bottom, and that's the thing we call latitude. Co-latitude then is from zero at the top to 180 degrees at the bottom, okay? And we call it co-latitude to distinguish it from latitude. Um, when you're doing problems, one thing to be careful about is often the spinning object will actually be the Earth. And if in the problem you're given a latitude, you have to bear in mind that just using latitude in these problems is dangerous. You have to convert it to co-latitude, okay? Um, we'll look at some of those problems later, so I'll show you how that comes about. All right. If we think about a point on our rotating object, um, it has an angular velocity, and it has a radius from, from the center, um, and it has a um, linear velocity as well. So instantaneously at any particular point, it's moving tangential to um, the, the rotational direction, and um, we can get that... Um, rotation uh, or that velocity relative to um, to that tangent by a cross product okay and you'll you'll know, you'll know this at least in terms of magnitudes from first year that that linear velocity that you have um, is equal to the product of omega and the um, distance around the the circle of rotation that you have um, in our case here, what we do is we're actually taking it as a cross product in here, okay? Um, so some of you will be going, hang on a second, shouldn't this be connected to this distance in here, right? Because really what's happening is this point that's on the surface is actually going around a circle that has a radius of rho, not a radius of, of, of little r. And that's actually correct, right? So... Um, when you learn this in first year, you've got V equals um, R omega, um, and R here would be rho, because it's the s s um, radius of the circle around this thing, around which this thing's traveling, right? Which is fine, but in terms of the way we defer, define it for mechanics in terms of vectors, we have a cross product here that is V equals omega cross R, right? And if you think about this for a second, what you're doing is taking the cross product of um, this radius vector r from the center of, um, of the body's rotation um, and the angular um, velocity vector here. And, of course, when you take a cross product, it's the magnitude of one times the magnitude of the other times the sine of the angle in between, right? So this would be omega r sine phi, a uh, sine theta, and, of course, r sine theta is just this rho, right? So we've actually got a consistent thing here. It's either what you would learn in first year, which is um, rotation, radius of rotation times the angle of velocity, or here we've got a cross product to get us this thing, and that automatically pops out the sign that turns into this, okay? Um, 
let me let me just reinforce that real quick then. So um, we've got um, v equals omega cross r, which would just be omega uh, sine theta, which is just omega uh, rho. Um, don't even need to put a vector sign on this. Omega rho. Okay. Um, so that should all make sense there. Okay, now one thing here is you'll spot something that, um, actually some of you won't, depends how rigorous you are about keeping track of where things go. Um, if I looked, you know, if I was to go back and look through my book of um, um, cross products and so forth, um, I would remember for rotational motion, pretty much everything has an R at the front, right? Um, so your angular momentum is, 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 is R cross, your torque is R cross F, and so forth. Um, this is actually kind of the one exception just here where you have R on the end. And I'll point it out when it becomes obvious to point it out in lecture two from now, why it is that the R is on the end for this particular cross product in rotational motion rather than on the front. But um, I always got in the habit um, as an undergrad of remembering that for rotational motion, the R is always at the front because we're most interested in the rotation. And this is the one case that violates that rule. Um, okay, and there's one other quick thing here to point out, which is that um, our V here is actually really dr on dt. So what we can do here is take this thing here and really just write it as dr vector on dt um, is equal to omega cross r. And that relationship holds not just for the vector r, but for any vector fixed in the rotating body. So um, I could choose any vector I like that's connected to this rotating body, so it's actually in the, um, as we would say in the coming lectures, it's in the um, ro co-rotating reference frame of the rotating object, so it's a reference frame attached to the rotating object. We'd have some vector in there, and that would obey the same thing, so the, the um, change in that vector with respect to time is just omega times, uh, omega cross that particular vector, um, with R being one of those cases. But you could you could choose, for example, to have um, in this rotational space here um, a set of vectors that define a coordinate system x, y, z that's connected to this object that rotates separately to your inertial reference frame, which would have a fixed x, y, and z, right? And you can look at how that vector changes as a function of time by basically just taking the cross product of the angular velocity and that particular vector. Okay, so it's not just R to some interest point of interest, it can be any vector that's attached to that rotational object that rotates with it will obey that relationship. Okay, we need to point that one out because we're going to use it in a second. And so what I want to do is spend the last little bit of this lecture um, looking at two very quick relations. One is just to prove that um, we have addition of angular velocities um, and that they add sensibly, as you would expect, vectors to. And then I want to generate one quick result about time derivatives here so that we can use it in the next four lectures. We'll use it again and again and again. It's a really useful relationship. Okay. So the first one, this is actually really quick. Um, Addition of angular velocities. It's a fairly simple one. Imagine we got two um, frames, one and two, um, with a refer with a relative velocity v two one. So we've got um, one frame moving relative to another, um, and we compare those velocities, right? And we have some object which we'll call three, and it's moving relative to frame two. Um, what is the velocity of um, that object rel 3 relative to um, frame 1? So what we have in here is, um, say, a frame 1. We have a frame 2, which is moving with some velocity v2, 1. And then we have some body, let's call it 3 here, that's moving with some um, velocity 
three, two relative to two, what's its velocity relative to one, okay? And we know this fairly easily. This is just from the first half where we dealt, dealt with um, linear um, reference frames. Our velocity in three, one is just going to be the speed of our object three, two, plus the velocity of um, this frame to relative to frame one, okay? So it's the same idea that if I'm in the moving reference frame two and my body three is moving relative to me, it's the velocity I see of that plus the velocity of me moving relative to that other frame is the velocity of this moving relative to that other frame, okay? Fairly simple relationship here. Um, then what we can imagine is instead of it being a linearly moving frame, what we're actually doing here is just considering instantaneously a point on the surface of a rotating object, right? And so we can assume that it's going to have some instantaneous velocity and um, it might be a frame that's, you know, a body that's rotating relative to a frame that's rotating relative to a fixed frame, okay? So um, let me try and set this up by imagining my room here is my inertial frame. Um, I am a rotating frame myself, and then I have a rotating object in that frame, right? And so at any particular point in time, um, my frame, some point in my frame has a velocity and it'll be tangential to the inertial frame. And then this object will have a point on the surface and it will be moving tangentially to my reference frame and the rotating frame and the um, frame outside, okay? And that will still hold as a relationship exactly like this one, at least instantaneously, right? Because velocities um, in rotational motion are linear instantaneously along a tangent. So we know that this thing still holds, um, but what we can do is substitute the velocity that we have in the linear motion for the cross product um, that we would have in a rotational motion because it's actually a rotational motion long term. So this thing would be omega 3, 1 cross um, r equals omega 3, 2 cross r plus omega 2, 1 cross r. And this is basically taking some origin. Um, and because it's a rotational motion, I can basically make the three origins align with each other, right? I can make the origin of my inertial reference frame, which is the room, sit at the center of rotation for, for me. And I could make, you know, I'd have to put it inside me, but I could make this object rotate on the inside, right? I can imagine I've got like a something inside my body that's rotating as well. So you could give them a common origin. So that means that the position that I'm interested in has the same R for all of them, okay? And again, this is what I mean by um, these rotational systems not being mathematically complex, but being a difficult to visualize. So you may want to stop at various points in this video and actually think through what that's going to look like and how it's going to behave, right? It's one of those skills that as you go further on in physics, you kind of have to teach yourself how to see things. Um, we can write the same R in here. So this is now going to be up omega 3, 2 plus omega 2, 1 cross R. And of course, I can cancel that out on the two sides because it's the same thing. So I've got omega 3, 1 is equal to omega 3, 2 plus omega 2, 1. Okay, and so basically all I've shown in here is that um, if I have rotational systems, I can add angular velocities as vectors in the same way that I would add linear velocities as vectors um, in comparing objects to reference frames and reference frames to reference frames, okay? Um, all I've done is just taken a, a linear mechanics relation and translate it to rotational mechanics. Okay, so we have uh, angular velocities adding the same way as translational velocities. And now when we go to um, rotational frames, there's one more thing we have to worry about, which is the time derivative of vectors. And before I do that, I just want to cover um, some notation. You remember in the first half, what we did was we reserved lowercase letters for objects. So um, an object had an acceleration little a and a velocity little v. 
And for non-inertial frames, we used capital letters. So the acceleration of our non-inertial frame was big A. We kind of keep the same thing for rotational frames. And what we do is allocate little omega um, to spinning objects. And rotating frames have an angular velocity of big omega just here. And we use that to distinguish between the two because some things come about because of an object rotating and some things come about because of a reference frame rotating. And you'll see in coming lectures where these two things um, pop out and become important. So what we have to do in here is consider two frames, um, S0 and S, um, rotating relative to one another with uh, angular velocity big omega, okay? And so you can imagine we have our um, stationary frame X, Y, Z, um, S0, and it's fixed. It's like the room I'm sitting in at the moment. You can also imagine a rotating reference frame S that is rotating relative to um, our inertial frame S0, okay? And what we're interested in is looking at a vector Q in our rotating reference frame and how that changes in that rotating reference frame, so a dQ on dt, and how that translates into a change in that vector as perceived by an observer in an inertial reference frame. And there's two things going on here. First is that there might be some change in this vector Q. It might be getting longer, it might be getting shorter, it might be changing direction. There's also an apparent change in Q as far as the inertial reference frame is concerned because my reference frame is rotating, right? And, and that is basically that this sort of motion is going on. And we need to be able to translate a change in a vector from one frame to another in some mathematical way, okay? So let's work through this for a second. What we're going to do is distinguish dq on dt between the two frames. So um, if I've got brackets around it with an s0, it's going to be the change of that vector in the frame s0. If it's got a s down here, it's in the frame s. Okay, And we're going to start from the frame s. Let's just go to pen frame s. So we have some vector q that's attached to our frame s. So it's basically a vector that's in the frame um, would be fixed for the moment and we can define it relative to a set of axes that are in that frame. So you can imagine for me at the moment there would be a E1, a, a, like a E1, E2, E3 for me that's you know forward, backwards, left, right and up, down. Okay, And I can write Q as components of that. So it would just be Q1, um, E1 hat plus Q2, E2 hat plus Q3, E3 hat. And E3, E2, E1 are just unit vectors, and I haven't called them X, Y, and Z because I might want to call them something else, right? They're not necessarily the X, Y, and Z that I'd have in my inertial frame, so I need to give them a new name. And the hat on the top tells me it's a unit vector, so it has length of one, okay? And an easy way to write this would be sum over I, Q, I, E, I, hat. And we do this quite a lot, okay? All right, um, I can take the time derivative of Q in my frame S. And if I think about this vector in my frame that's attached to me being able to rotate, there's only, there's only certain ways that it can change, right? My unit vectors E1, E1, E2, E3 are fixed. They've got fixed length, they've got fixed orientation in the frame that I'm sitting in. And so the only way that Q can change is that the length of Q either changes or it changes its position. And what this corresponds to is Q1, Q2, and Q3 changing in some way. Okay. So what we can do in here is basically say this is going to be the sum over I, dQi on dt, times E hat I. And we don't have any differential term for E hat I because the E hat I vectors are fixed. In, in, in my frame S, okay? Okay, perfectly good. In S0, we're gonna see something slightly different. Um, in S0, um, even if my Q vector is fixed in S, so imagine it's fixed in S, as, as far as Q, as, as far as S0 is concerned, the fact that I'm rotating means that that vector Q is changing and 
it's actually changing because the vector unit vector components in my space are changing as far as the um, inertial frame is concerned. So if you imagine my um, E1 vector, it's changing in that inertial frame because basically it's not changing its length, it's just changing its orientation, right? But on top of that, I could have a change in the components of, of Q that correspond to a change in length of Q or a change in orientation of Q in that rotating frame. So I have to account for both in this particular case. And so as far as S0 is concerned, dQ on dt S0 is going to be the sum over I um, dQi on dt e hat I. In other words, the same change that you would see in S plus sum over I Q I D E I on dt. In other words, the unit vectors are changing, and of course they're unit length, so they can only be changing by their orientation, right? Um, now, at this point, we want to take this little term on the end, and we want to go back two slides, and you'll remember that we had this relationship here, that if we have any um, vector that's fixed with a rotating body, and in this particular case, um, not just Q, but E1, E2, and E3 are, then um, the change in that vector will be equal to omega cross E, okay? So what I can say in here is that D, wrong color, D, E, I on D, T, um, is going to be um, omega, and the omega in this case is the rotation of the frame, so it's going to be big omega, cross that particular vector, so it'll just be e i hat, okay? And so what I can do now is carry this expression down to the next line, so what we have here is dq on dt in s naught will be equal to if you look at this term here, it is that, so it's this thing here, right? So this will be um, dq on dt of s. And then um, I can use this expression here to knock out that term on the right, okay? So this will be plus sigma i um, qi um, omega cross e i um, hat. And, of course, the sum on the front and the qi are really just scalar components that I can bring on the inside, right? So this is going to be dq on dt in frame s plus uh, omega cross sum over i qi e i hat. And, of course, this last term on the right is just q. So this is um, dq on dt of s plus omega cross q, and that gives me the expression that I've just got on here on the slide, okay? And so what that says is basically, if I look from the inertial frame, in other words, my room, um, the vector that I have in the rotating frame can change in two ways. One is it can change because that vector is actually changing in that rotating frame and that is this component here, right? The other thing is that it will change because that frame is rotating relative to the inertial frame, right? And so if I rotate, you can see that my Q vector is actually changing despite the fact that it's, it, you know, it's fixed in, in, in my rotating frame, like the same length of drumstick pointing in the same direction. Um, but it's changing as far as the inertial frame is concerned. Um, because of the rotation of that frame, and that comes about because of this term on the end here. And of course, if this rotating frame stops rotating, this term goes away, and so the change in any length in vector here would be the same as the change in any length of vector in the other side, okay? So all we're really doing here is just basically translating a change in vector length and accounting for the fact that one reference frame is rotating with respect to the other, okay?
really important relation for coming up lectures. Um, so in the next one, we'll start applying this and we'll get centrifugal and centripetal forces. And then after that, we'll start to handle more complicated rotating systems um, in terms of going from really simple bodies to more complicated shaped rigid bodies and how to handle those from a mechanical perspective. I'll see you next time.